in ruins. Heidegger was stripped of his post at the university. Meanwhile his house, together with his precious library, were requisitioned by the occupying French forces. Heidegger was outraged, and wrote to the military authorities, I wish to protest in the strongest possible terms against this attack on my person and on my work. Why should I have been singled out for punishment and defamation before the eyes of the whole city, indeed before the eyes of the world? He still did not understand. Yet worse was to come. He now had to suffer the indignity of appearing before a denazification committee to explain himself. Even so, he still saw no reason to assume personal responsibility for his public support for the Führer. As a consequence, he was banned from teaching, a ban that would last until 1951. But he still covertly lectured to private gatherings of well-heeled citizens, many of whose feelings toward the immediate past remained as ambiguous as his own. He had not personally been responsible for anti-Semitic atrocities, and one assumes that the revelations of the Holocaust must have horrified him, yet still he refused to apologize. And thus it would remain. In 1968, Heidegger invited the great German-Jewish poet Paul Celan for a three-day visit to his chalet at Todnaburg. Heidegger deeply admired the angst-ridden quality of Celan's poetry, Reading it was to approach the question of being. Likewise, Celan had long deeply admired Heidegger's thought, and was warmly welcomed by the aging philosopher, one of the few to be honoured with an invitation to stay with him at Tottenburg. The two men were utterly disparate. The quiet, private, admiring old man, and the mentally unstable poet obsessed with the fate of his people. Surprisingly, they appeared to achieve a deep rapport. Yet even then no apology was forthcoming. Celan left, utterly bewildered. Some years earlier Heidegger had been visited by Hannah Arendt. By now she had a growing reputation in America as a political philosopher, though her thinking remained deeply influenced by Heidegger. Before their first post-war meeting she was wary of him, naturally suspicious of his attitude and stance during the Nazi era. Yet face to face it all seemed different. Something of their former intellectual intimacy rekindled. She was happily married, and Heidegger had told Elfrida about his earlier affair with Hannah. Elfrida, who remained anti-Semitic, grudgingly accepted Hannah's presence during their subsequent meetings when Hannah visited Europe. Hannah Arendt did her best to promote Heidegger's work in America, ensuring that his ideas were understood and appreciated among a wider audience. Heidegger's reputation gradually emerged from under its cloud, and his influence began to spread. For years he had already been appreciated in Europe, most notably by the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre. But now, with the publication of the English translation of Being and Time in 1962, he was assured of a worldwide reputation. A year later, Hannah Arendt reported on the Jerusalem trial of the Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann. In the course of this, she coined the phrase, the banality of evil, to describe Eichmann, whose bureaucratic small-mindedness had been responsible for such unspeakable horror. Although she refused to admit it, she had already encountered a man whose behavior fitted this category. Arendt remained a deep admirer of Heidegger, sometimes to the point of self-delusion. Heidegger, for his part, never fully accepted Arendt's growing fame. In 1975, Hannah Arendt died. A year later, Heidegger died on May 26th, at the age of 86. He was buried, as he had wished, at Meskirch in the Black Forest, where he had been born. Sir Fransky tellingly closes his great biography of Heidegger by quoting the philosopher's own words used in another context. Yet once more a way of doing philosophy sinks into the darkness. Comments and Criticisms Heidegger specifically quotes several examples of the pre-Socratic thought that he sought to emulate and resurrect. But you should learn all, the untrembling heart of unconcealment, well-rounded, and also the opinions of mortals who lack the ability to trust what is unconcealed. Parmenides, 
In the following passage, Heidegger speaks of the concealment of being which Aletheia, unconcealedness, penetrates to discover the truth of being. Concealment can be a refusal or merely a dissembling. We are never completely sure whether it is one or the other. Concealment conceals and dissembles itself. This means that the open place in the midst of beings, the clearing, is never a precise stage with a permanently raised curtain where the play of beings unfolds. On the contrary, the clearing takes place only as this double concealment. The unconcealment of beings, such is never a simply existent state, instead it is a happening. Unconcealment, truth, is neither an attribute of matters in the sense of beings, nor one of propositions. The Origin of the Work of Art Philosophy remains latent in every human existence, and need not be first added to it from somewhere else. The Metaphysical Foundations of Logic Philosophy gets under way only by a peculiar insertion of our own existence into the fundamental possibilities of Dasein as a whole. For this insertion three things are of decisive importance. First, we must allow space for beings as a whole. Second, we must release ourselves into the nothing. In other words, we must liberate ourselves from those idols everyone has before which everyone cringes. And finally, we must let the sweep of our suspense take its full course so that it swings back into the basic question of metaphysics, which the nothing itself compels. Why is there being at all, and why not, rather, nothing? What is metaphysics? The greatness of the discovery of phenomenology lies not in results obtained by factual means, which can be evaluated and analyzed, and nowadays have certainly evoked a veritable transformation in questioning and working, but rather in this. It is the discovery of the very possibility of doing research in philosophy. But a possibility is properly understood in its most proper sense only when it continues to be taken as a possibility and preserved as a possibility. However, preserving it as a possibility does not mean to fix a chance state of research and inquiry as ultimately real and allow it to solidify. On the contrary, it means to keep open the tendency toward the matters themselves. History of the Concept of Time Prolegomena Hence, being in is not to be explained ontologically by some ontical characterization, as if one might say, for example, that being in in a world is a spiritual property, and that man's spatiality is a result of his bodily nature, which at the same time always gets founded upon corporeality. Here again we are faced with the being present at hand together, of some such spiritual thing with a corporeal thing, while the being of the entity thus compounded remains more obscure than ever. Being and Time The critical reception of such work was mixed. The celebrated European thinker George Steiner regards Heidegger highly. The Heideggerian revaluation literally forces one to attempt to rethink the very concept of thought. Only a major thinker can provoke so creatively. In this context, it is worth noting that Steiner is not only Jewish, but also well aware of Heidegger's disgraceful behavior during the Nazi era. He also said, In the history of Western thought, there is no other work like Sein und Zeit. While many agree with this, not all see such estimation as a complimentary assessment. Other well-known thinkers have been more forthright in their critical opinions. The following is just one example of many, and far from being the most extreme. The master of complicated banalities, Heidegger's modus philosophandi is neurotic through and through, and is ultimately rooted in his psychic crankiness. His kindred spirits, close or distant, are sitting in lunatic asylums, some as patients, some as psychiatrists, on a philosophical rampage. For all its critical analysis, philosophy has not yet managed to root out its psychopaths. What do we have psychiatric diagnosis for? C. G. Jung Chronology of Heidegger's Life and Times 1889 Martin Heidegger, born September 26th in Meskirch in southern Germany 1909 Studies Theology at Freiburg 1911 Shifts to Studying Philosophy 
1913, graduates at Freiburg. 1914, outbreak of World War. 1917, marries Elfrieda Petri. 1918, Heidegger called to active service, but German army collapses before he becomes engaged in fighting. Kaiser flees to Holland. Germany surrenders to the Allies. 1920s. Germany hit by the inflation years. Reichmarks lose their value to the extent that it takes a wheelbarrow full of notes to buy a loaf of bread. 1923. Heidegger becomes associate professor of philosophy at University of Marburg. 1924. Meets and falls in love with 18-year-old Hannah Arendt. 1927. Publishes Sein und Zeit, Being and Time. 1928. Succeeds Hossel as Professor of Philosophy at University of Freiburg. 1929. Wall Street Collapse. 1930s. The Great Depression spreads throughout the world, destroying Germany's fragile economic recovery. 1933. Hitler and the Nazis come to power in Germany. Nazis issue decree dismissing all Jews from the civil service, which includes the universities. Heidegger becomes rector of University of Freiburg. 1934. Resigns as rector. 1939. Outbreak of World War II. 1945. German defeat by Allies. 1945-1951. Heidegger banned from teaching because of Nazi involvement. 1950. Meets Hannah Arendt for the first time since her emigration to America. 1962. English translation of Being and Time published. 1976 dies at the age of 86. Chronology of Significant Philosophical Dates 6th century BC The beginning of Western philosophy with Thales of Miletus End of 6th century BC Death of Pythagoras 399 BC Socrates sentenced to death in Athens Circa 387 BC Plato founds the Academy in Athens, the first university. 335 BC. Aristotle founds the Lyceum in Athens, a rival school to the Academy. 324 AD. Emperor Constantine moves capital of Roman Empire to Byzantium. 400 AD. St. Augustine writes his Confessions, philosophy absorbed into Christian theology. 410 AD. Sack of Rome by Visigoths heralds opening of Dark Ages. 529 A.D. Closure of Academy in Athens by Emperor Justinian marks end of Hellenic thought. Mid-13th century. Thomas Aquinas writes his commentaries on Aristotle, era of scholasticism. 1453. Fall of Byzantium to Turks, end of Byzantine Empire. 1492. Columbus reaches America. Renaissance in Florence and revival of interest in Greek learning. 1543. Copernicus publishes On the Revolution of the Celestial Orbs, proving mathematically that the earth revolves around the sun. 1633. Galileo forced by church to recant heliocentric theory of the universe. 1641. Descartes publishes his Meditations, the start of modern philosophy. 1677. Death of Spinoza allows publication of his ethics. 1687. Newton publishes Principia, introducing concept of gravity. 1689. Locke publishes Essay Concerning Human Understanding, start of empiricism. 1710. Barclay publishes Principles of Human Knowledge, Advancing Empiricism to New Extremes. 1716. Death of Leibniz. 1739-1740. to 1740, Hume publishes Treatise of Human Nature, Taking Empiricism to Its Logical Limits. 1781. Kant, awakened from his dogmatic slumbers by Hume, publishes Critique of Pure Reason. Great Era of German Metaphysics Begins 1807 Hegel publishes The Phenomenology of Mind High Point of German Metaphysics 1818 Schopenhauer publishes The World as Will and Representation Introducing Indian Philosophy into German Metaphysics 1820-1830 
1889. Nietzsche, having declared God is dead, succumbs to madness in Turin. 1921. Wittgenstein publishes Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, claiming the final solution to the problems of philosophy. 1920s. Vienna Circle propounds logical positivism. 1927. Heidegger publishes Being and Time, heralding split between analytical and continental philosophy. 1943. Sartre publishes Being and Nothingness, advancing Heidegger's thought and instigating existentialism. 1953. Posthumous publication of Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations. High Era of Linguistic Analysis. This concludes the reading of Heidegger in 90 Minutes by Paul Strathern, 2002. This book was read by Robert Whitfield. Unabridged Recording, 2004. Thank you. To approach the question of being. Likewise, Celan had long deeply admired Heidegger's thought, and was warmly welcomed by the aging philosopher, one of the few to be honoured with an invitation to stay with him at Tottenburg. The two men were utterly disparate. The quiet, private, admiring old man, and the mentally unstable poet obsessed with the fate of his people in ruins. Heidegger was stripped of his post at the university. Meanwhile his house, together with his precious library, were requisitioned by the occupying French forces. Heidegger was outraged, and wrote to the military authorities, I wish to protest in the strongest possible terms against this attack on my person and on my work. Why should I have been singled out for punishment and death must have horrified him, yet still he refused to apologize. And thus it would remain. In 1968, Heidegger invited the great German-Jewish poet Paul Celan for a three-day visit to his chalet at Todnaburg. Heidegger deeply admired the angst-ridden quality of Celan's poetry. Reading it was to... As a consequence, he was banned from teaching, a ban that would last until 1951. But he still covertly lectured to private gatherings of well-heeled citizens, many of whose feelings toward the immediate past remained as ambiguous as his own. He had not personally been responsible for anti-Semitic atrocities, and one assumes that the revelations of the Holocaust are mentioned before the eyes of the whole city, indeed before the eyes of the world. He still did not understand. Yet worse was to come. He now had to suffer the indignity of appearing before a denazification committee to explain himself. Even so, he still saw no reason to assume personal responsibility for his public support for the Führer.